I'm Jennifer Pulley. Welcome to NASA 360. Okay, right off the top, I got a quick question for you. Where does NASA launch most of its space missions? <laughs> well, for those of you that don't know, let me give you a hint. If I said launch at the Cape, would you know what then? Yep, it's Cape Canaveral, the Kennedy Space Center. The Kennedy Space Center has been the launching point for virtually every NASA mission since, well, the beginning of NASA. This place is amazing, and today you're in for a special treat because NASA 360 is going behind the scenes to take a closer look at some of the amazing facilities here at Kennedy. And we'll also meet some of the people down here on the space coast of Florida who make those launches possible. Here's Johnny Alonzo to get the show rolling. Hey, how's it going? I'm Johnny Alonzo. Today I'm at one of the most recognizable places in the world, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. This is where all the most important American missions have been launched. Dig it, missions like Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Skylab, and all the shuttle flights, and not to mention hundreds of other important scientific flights too. This will also be the place where NASA's new Ares rocket will blast off into space when we go back to the moon. So this is the place to be if you want to know how NASA gets these huge rockets into space. Main engine ignition, three, two, one. So what does it take to get a vehicle in space? <laughs> well, it's not very easy. Thousands of people must perform extraordinary jobs every day just to get a vehicle ready for launch. And I'm not talking about all the planning and engineering it takes to build a spacecraft. No, I'm talking about just getting it ready to fly, putting it in launch position and blasting off into space. But before we start our tour, let's take a few minutes and talk about some of the important historical events that have happened here at Kennedy. It wasn't until near the end of World War II when the U.S. really started getting interested in rocket flight. The main reason was because the Germans were using a rocket called the V-2 as a weapon against us. Even though this was a terrible weapon, American planners saw the potential this rocket could have militarily and as a forerunner to large rockets that could help us explore space. So after the war, the military brought about 100 captured V-2 rockets back to the States and began testing them in New Mexico. It wasn't long before researchers realized that they needed a place to test longer range rockets. So in 1949, President Harry Truman established the Joint Long Range Proving Ground at Cape Canaveral. The Cape was the perfect place for this type of testing because its location was so remote that nearby communities would not be in danger, and of course the weather permitted year-round testing. Okay, fast forward a few years. It's now 1957, and the Navy was testing the Vanguard rocket to send the first satellite in space. They had sent up two of these rockets on suborbital test flights, but were all in for a big shock on October 4, 1957, when the Russians beat us to the punch, launching Sputnik, the first man-made satellite into space. The race for space was now on, and soon the name Cape Canaveral would be one of the most well-known places on Earth. Soon after Sputnik was launched, NASA selected the first astronauts to participate in our manned space flight efforts, Project Mercury. And one of the main goals was to learn as much as possible about space to help us to get ready to go to the moon. On May 5, 1961, Alan Shepard became the first American in space with the launch of the first Mercury flight called Freedom 7. Although his flight was suborbital and only took about 15 minutes, the U.S. had done it. We had put an American into space for the first time. In that same year, President Kennedy told the world that the U.S. would be striving to put humans on the moon and bring them back safely by the end of the 1960s. So with this new deadline, training and flights began getting fast and furious. After the Mercury missions were complete, Project Gemini was launched. Astronauts gained valuable information on docking in space while also performing the first American spacewalk. But with the last Gemini flight in 1966, all eyes turned to Apollo, and the moon was our next target. It's amazing, isn't it? In just under 10 years, we went from barely understanding how to get humans off this Earth to preparing to send them to the moon. So on July 20th, 1969, the nation's goal of putting humans on the moon was realized when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed at the Sea of Tranquility on the moon. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. This flight was followed with six other Apollo flights with Apollo 17 becoming the last flight to the moon. NASA quickly closed the book on the moon missions, focusing their talents and technology on a new craft called the Space Shuttle. Now, many of you watching this have never known a time when humans weren't flying in space. A lot of us take that for granted. But let me tell you something, it's not easy to prepare everything you gotta do to get up to space. All right, so are you ready to go on a tour? Let's roll and check out some of the facilities here at Kennedy and meet some of the hardworking people that are making these spacecraft fly. The VAB is where the space shuttle gets assembled for spaceflight. This is how it works. First, the solid rocket boosters are mated together and attached to the giant external fuel tank. 
Then the orbiter gets towed and raised to a vertical position with overhead cranes. It's attached to the other components and is ready to go. Well, almost ready to go. So how do I get the orbiter out of this building and onto the launch pad? <laughs> well, with one of the baddest moving trucks you've ever seen. Around here, they just call it the crawler. Tell me about the crawler. Well, Johnny, the crawler was built uh, about 1965. And uh, it was basically the, uh, it was the main transport to take the Apollo vehicle okay. from the vehicle assembly building sure. out to the pad. This thing is huge. It's 130 feet long, about 115 feet wide. And uh, what's, what's max weight on this thing? Well, let's see, the crawl, it's, uh, it's about six and a half million pounds. Pretty heavy. So it stays on the ground, no problem. Yeah, you know? <laughs> but the uh, the crawler carries uh, right now it's carrying about 13 million pounds. 13 less. million. Yeah. Pounds. So you got a total weight of crawler and vehicle of about 18 million some pounds. Oh my goodness. Rolling down the road. I'm going to assume this thing doesn't go very fast. It's not real super fast. Yeah. Uh, we we like to keep it probably around a mile an hour. Now its design speed when it was first designed was uh, almost a speed of two. But actually, it is fast when you're on the crawler, uh -huh. I mean, because of the mass that it's moving. So, you fill the tank up. <laughs> I'm just going to ask you, if you fill up the tank, I mean, you know, what can you get per gallon? <laughs> well, it, it's about 38 feet per gallon. <laughs> 38 feet per gallon. Oh, yeah. yeah. And we actually have two tanks on the, on the crawler. Each are 2,500 gallons apiece. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So, it'll, it'll last a couple of operations. Tell me, what does the crawler do? Well, the crawler, the basic, the basic task of the crawler is to pick up the mobile launch platform. The mobile launch platform, of course, has the vehicle stack on it. Sure. And it moves it from the assembly building, and it moves it out to the pad, okay. and then sets it down, and then moves back away from it. And then once the vehicle launches, it goes and picks up that mobile launch platform, okay. and brings it back to the vehicle assembly building for another stack. Is there only one crawler? Uh, no, there's actually two. Oh, there. Uh, yeah, NASA had two of them built. Uh, back uh, for the Apollo program. All right, so we know what kind of mileage this, this huge thing gets. Um, how's it powered? Well, you know, funny she'd ask that. Why don't we just go up here and we'll check it out? Let's go. Yeah, walk back into history. Wow, look at this. <laughs> These engines here, they, they, those are the same engines that have been on here since 65. Since 1965. This is what powers the crawler here. There's actually two of these. There's one here. Okay. One on the other side. Okay. And each one of these powers two 1,000 kilowatt DC generators. Really? Kind of works like a diesel uh, electric locomotive. Sure. Let me ask you, so how do you move this thing? How do you drive it? Well, come on, I'll show you. Sure. We'll walk right up here. OK, Johnny, come on. Let's come in this cab right here. OK. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> this is the operator's cab. Wait a minute, wait, wait. That's the steering wheel? <laughs> Yeah, it's not your typical steering wheel. <laughs> for such a big rig, my for, God. For probably one of the largest vehicles, this is quite a small steering wheel. <laughs> the steering itself is, uh, of course, it's all electronic. Yes. And uh, what's happening with this, with this wheel is when you're turning it, it's sending a signal back to what we call our PLC, which is Programmable Logic Controller. Okay. And it takes that signal sends another one out to some hydraulic pumps uh -huh. that in turn move these large cylinders out here. And oh, the, cool. the cylinders themselves move the trucks back and forth. Sure. And of course it uh, steers itself down the crawler way as to, you know, depending on what kind of degree you put in. Is that how you control the speed? Exactly. This is, this is just like a, this is like a foot pedal, you know, a speed pedal mm -hmm. in the car. Uh, what you're doing here is you just increase the, increase this pot control and it, uh, it takes those, uh, when we looked at those generators back there, it excites those fields. Yes. And uh, by exciting those fields, we can uh, adjust the speed of these propel motors down there. Huh. And then along with the gas pedal, you know, you got a transmission. It's just, just like a car, forward, neutral, reverse. The other thing that the crawler operators are always worried about is this height, because one of the basic operations of the crawler is moving the mobile launch platform out to a set of columns, setting those down and moving out from under it. So he's always he's always aware of what his height is, and he does it here by this average height meter. It's been a pleasure. It's a lot of fun. Thank you so much for bringing oh, us around. Oh no, today. we enjoyed it, Johnny. We glad we're glad to have people come out and take a look at our machine. Definitely, this was a lot of fun. You're watching NASA 360. We'll be right back.
wow, that crawler, it's huge. To give you a better idea of just how big that thing really is, listen to this. Those tracks that they use each have 57 shoes, and those shoes weigh nearly 2,000 pounds each. All right, let's switch gears a little. You may have heard of something called the thermal protection system on the shuttle. You know all those black tiles along the bottom? You may also know that they help shield the craft from the 3,000 degree re-entry heat when it comes back into the Earth's atmosphere. But do you know what they're made of? Well, it's a pretty cool story. Johnny is over at the Thermal Protection System facility to see how the process works. Okay, so we're here at the Thermal Protection System facilities with Martin Wilson. How are you? I'm doing great. Good to see you. You too. Um, and this is where tiles begin life, right? This is uh, the part of the process where, where tiles begin. Uh, you know, this object right here is called a tile production unit. Okay. Uh, it weighs about uh, three pounds. Yeah. It's a very low density material, rigidized uh, fibrous ceramic, okay. capable of withstanding around about 23, 2400 degrees, uh, over 3000 for very short periods of time. Sure. And uh, we make these, uh, these uh, billets as we call them in here. Uh, we start off with uh, several different types of ceramic fiber that are all pre-kitted and pre-weighed. Yeah. Uh, these materials are put into this blender that we have over here with about 25 gallons of water gotcha. and various chemical additives, ammonium hydroxide, okay. uh, silicon carbide, other surfactants and what have you. Uh, we put them in this machine, we basically turn it on and uh, it uh, blends the fiber for around about 12 minutes. Okay. And uh, after the blending process is done, we go ahead and we put it in this uh, casting tower over on the other side of the room. This uh, device here is uh, called a casting tower and it's uh, really simply a hydraulic press. Uh, we have around about 25 gallons of the, uh, the prepared slurry, which is the chopped fiber, water, surfactant and the other additives. Sure. And uh, we now go through the process of loading it into the, uh, into the press. And despite many years of high-tech methods of getting the slurry from the bucket to the tower. This, this is how we do it. It actually takes about 25 gallons of water to produce one block. And actually for the, for the CEV, for the Orion, we're using this. That's, that's actually what this is for. Oh. Uh, because these tiles are very light. Right. Uh, extremely resistant to micrometeorites and because of the trajectory of the new vehicle it's going to see some pretty high temperatures but for fairly short periods of time and now they start this gradual dewatering process which actually takes uh, takes a little while to do At this stage of the process uh, the, the billet's been pressed the next step is to actually extrude the billet out of the tower. At that point, it'll be taken to the other end of the building, dried for uh, 16 hours at 250 degrees, and then ultimately fired in a, uh, in a kiln at 2,450 for several hours, and that uh, will give you the, the block that I showed you to start off with. So we are in a new section of the building. Um, why don't you tell us where we are, and what do you do here? Well, this is the, uh, this is the machine shop, and this is where the, uh, the actual base tiles are machined out of the billets of material that we produced down at the other end of the building. There's several different ways we can do that, uh, but primarily all of the tiles are machined using diamond coated tool steel cutters, okay. either on a manual machine, which is uh, called a tracer mill. The majority of the tiles we actually produce on these machines back here, this is a uh, five axis numerically controlled mill. Okay. Uh, they use these type of tools, these are diamond tool steel cutters. This machine is, uh, is highly automated, the program uh, originates back in the numerical design area. Okay. The whole, the entire process takes about 20 minutes. Sure. In the beginning, we'll start off taking a series of rough cuts just to take the bulk of the material away. And then there's a series of uh, smaller and finer tools that'll come in and start to take those surfaces away. So once they come out of the machine shop? Yes, the, the next uh, step of the process is to actually apply a series of ceramic coatings the materials themselves, at this point, do not have a lot of strength. So we put a coating on, it's either a black or a white coating, depending on the emittance properties required of the tile. And it's put on in several layers. We, we make the coatings in here. They're basically uh, very finely divided ceramic powders, either in alcohol or water with various thickening agents and uh, uh, emittance and pigments. Um, they're all sprayed by hand. Um, the coating goes on in a, basically a three-step process. Uh, but again, it's, it's one of those processes that is uh, a, a very exacting. 
a lot of weights and measures to make sure the coating is of the exact uh, correct thickness. This is the step that follows the, uh, the application of the coating okay. uh, that we just saw. The coating has been applied and uh, dried for several hours just at room temperature. Sure. Uh, but for the coating to um, consolidate or sinter, it has to be heated at uh, 2,200 degrees uh, for 90 minutes. Okay. And that's what we do in these kilns. And we have a tile in here that's been undergoing that sintering process. We can go ahead and take it out. Tiles at 2200 degrees, and you'll be able to see how the black coating uh, starts to cool down very, very rapidly. Yeah. Now, this is just raw, uncoated material. Sure. Look at them, they're glowing inside. But those you uh, you can actually go ahead and. Um, these you can you pick up? Yeah. These? Yeah, you just go ahead and grab them. Are you kidding me? Am I doing it right? Yep. Just pick them up by the corners. I'm so and... afraid to. What's that? <laughs> I'm afraid to. <laughs> as long as you just. Uh, handle them only with the lightest of pressure. With the lightest of pressure. You can go ahead and pick them up. This is so cool. <laughs> it's 2,000 degrees. Yep, it's 2,000 degrees. It's cooled off fairly quickly on the corners. Uh, you know, and that's the reason you're able to pick it up. It's still 2,200 degrees in the middle. You know, it will burn you if you're not too careful with it. Of course. Uh, but it is silica, it's very low density and uh, has a relatively low heat capacity, which is the only reason you're actually able to do that. <laughs> So tell me, how does the shuttle tile work? Well, in its simplest terms, a tile like this one here is really just a very, very lightweight, uh, but a super insulator. Okay. Uh, I mean, you can put heat to one side of it and eventually the um, backside of the tile will get hot. But uh, for any type of re-entry vehicle, you know exactly what re-entry uh, consists of. So you, you know approximately what the heat loads are gonna be, so then it's just a question of designing the tile to be of the correct thickness. And I can actually take this tile and uh, heat it up with a blowtorch, and you can see quite rapidly the surface will get up to about uh, a little over 2,000 degrees with just this propane torch. Okay. Uh, but the actual heat is, is, is soaking through the tile very, very slowly. Huh. I, you know, I could stand here for probably around about 20 minutes. Yes. Uh, before the back of the tile becomes uncomfortably hot and I'd have to put it down. Really? It's, it's not um, hot now? On the other side? No, it's not hot at all. at all. I've got my finger right on the back side of it and uh, I can't feel anything. <laughs> it's probably going to take about seven, to seven or eight minutes before it starts to warm up. So yes, you can wow. put your finger on the back of it. Yeah, it's yeah. just nothing. Nothing. And basically that's how, uh, how most of these ceramic uh, insulating strategies work. Right. Just very, very lightweight. Uh, they delay that heat pulse. Yes and uh, you know, can be used for any re-entry vehicle, be it an Earth re-entry vehicle or a uh, one entering Mars or any other planet. When you think of space flight, one thing you might not immediately think of is parachutes. But let me tell you, chutes really are important. I mean, they return the solid rocket boosters back to Earth. They help slow down the space shuttle on landing. And they will be used again when we phase out the space shuttle and begin flying our next generation space vehicles. Johnny jetted over to the parachute facility to find out more. Okay, so we are here at the Parachute Refurbishment Facility with my buddy Terry. Terry Magoon, how's it going, bro? Good, John. Good to see you. Glad uh, you could stop by. Thank you. Tell me, what are we doing here? Okay, what we're doing here is this place manufactures, refurbishes, repairs, and packs the parachutes for the solid rocket booster uh, first stage vehicle okay. for the shuttle program. Why isn't the chute solid? Why is it okay, like this? Okay, when you see the parachutes fly, they appear solid. Yes. Ribbon parachute like this withstands the heavy loads and the high dynamic loads much better than a solid parachute would. If you tried to put a solid parachute out with this much drag at the speeds that we're going out, you'd probably tear the parachute up. The boosters themselves, the, the white structures that are on the side of the shuttle right. uh, system, they come back and are reused time and time again. Uh, they're certified for up to 30 flights. So, uh, you know, we're still using the boosters every time again. So we don't build a new booster every time. We integrate the pieces into a new booster every time. So what are these parachutes made of? Uh, the major component, in fact, almost the only component of the SRB parachutes is nylon. The ribbons are fairly strong, but not that strong. These are good for about a thousand pound tensile strength if you were to tear it in this direction. Okay. A little bit more strength here because the load on the parachute is carried by this part and this just creates drag and holds the structure together. 
how big of a space can this <laughs> this incredibly <laughs> long parachute this, pack this, this, <laughs> yeah, this is a big parachute. Yeah. Uh, and this this parachute's 136 foot across uh -huh. at the bottom when it's fully inflated. Right. And we pack it into a bag, and the whole pack parachute weighs about 2,000 pounds, 2,200 and change. Wow. Now check it out. We got a couple guys working on one right now. Sure. Yeah. Well, we got we got Tom Gilliam and James Morell okay, that are working on the parachute, getting it put in the deployment bag here. Sure. And as you see, well, we've got the deployment bag is inverted, and they're stuffing the parachute in, vent first into the bag. Okay. They fold the parachute very carefully, and then lay it into the, the parachute deployment bag very carefully, and they tie it in all over the place with all of this 350-pound uh, cotton webbing. Sure. When the parachute comes out, it pops out like you or I would pop a thread, and that makes sure that this parachute streams out and inflates correctly every time. So let me ask you something. When these uh, parachutes are deployed, and they fall into the ocean. I mean, what do you do with them? Okay, they, they fall into the ocean and there's marine operations that goes out and there's two ships that go out. One recovers the parachutes off of each booster. Okay. The divers go in to get them and they put them on big reels on the back of the parachute, bring them back to us. We bring them back here and we rinse them. We don't really wash them because there's no detergent or agitation, but we rinse them out so that you get all the minerals out of it. Uh -huh. It's seawater, it's got minerals in it. If you let that dry, it creates a crystalline structure it's a sharp edge, and it'll mess up your parachute. It'll, it'll decrease the strength of the fiber. Sure. So Terry, obviously there are like a million things that have to go right, you know, but this is like one thing that most people don't even think about. Right, this is just one parachute of the parachute system. Yeah. This is just one process of the recovery system. The recovery system is just one process on the solid rocket booster. The solid rocket booster is just part of the shuttle system. <laughs> and of course, once the shuttle system gets up, they have the orbiter that goes up, does a mission, and comes back home to do it all over That's again. Amazing. It's a very complex process. I'm really glad to be part of it. Well, you know, Terry, thank you so much for your time. You're Let's welcome. See you around, right? Yes. All right, so we've scratched the surface a little to show a few of the things that are happening at the Kennedy Space Center. But you know, when our next generation space vehicles start flying in a few years, oh, we'll start a whole new chapter in the long history of the Kennedy Space Center. So in the upcoming years, NASA personnel will continue working hard to reach our new national goal of getting us back to the moon and onto Mars. And guess what? All of us, <laughs> we're gonna have a front row seat for it. That's it for this episode. For Johnny Alonzo, I'm Jennifer Pulley. Catch you next time on NASA 360. And one of the main goals is to get us ready to go to space. That's not right. Johnny is at the Thermal Protection Facility System Facility for Facility System System. This is where all the most important I'm talking about just getting it ready to fly. Yeah. Thousands of people must have formed. So yeah. And if you flip it over, it's... Take it. Oh, you do this. <laughs> and not to mention, and not to mention, the, uh, and not to mention hundreds of others. But let me tell you something. It is, I was gonna say, it ain't easy. <laughs> Sorry. For Johnny Alonzo, I'm Jennifer Pulley. Catch you next time on NASA 360. I don't even know my name. That's it for this episode. For Johnny Alonzo, I'm Jennifer Pulley. Catch you next time on NASA 360.